Hello folks, welcome to a new Hobby Nightmares video. In this video, we'll be looking at three stories. We'll be dealing with the first one, which covers Am I a Hobby Psychopath? Should be quite interesting. The second one will be Clueless D&D players have no clue. I think that's going to be a ranty, ranty DM. That's going to be quite interesting. And number three, the main event today, a 40k player annihilates his own misbehaving dice in the middle of the store. As somebody who has seen a meltdown like that in real life, I can tell you that's going to be a doozy. So, let's jump in, shall we? Uh, Faust says, Hello, Mr. Exile. Hello, Faust. How are you doing, man? Let me take a quick sip of tea. Um, if you are hearing my voice and you can hear that it's clearly breaking down, I have had a cold for the past few days. And, and it, I've gotten off easy. I've gotten off easy. It's not one of those achy colds because I am a bit of a a bit of a, a pussy when it comes to colds. I don't like them. You know what I mean? I, I, I crawl up into a ball and I don't function. But that's only when my body's achy. If I've got a head cold like this, it's fine. I'd crack on. You know what I mean? So I think I've got off easy. Anyway, thank you, Faust. Hope you're doing well. Uh, please call me Faust. I have done. I've been a big fan of your content for a while now. And trying not to f fillet you too heavily... <laughs> It's been a big contributor to me biting the bullet and actually moving into the painting and gaming side of the hobby. Good lad. Thank you. I love hearing things like that. Good. Good. If you want to make my day, just write in and say, I got you into the hobby. It literally makes my day. Like, honestly. Awesome stuff. I wanted to send you an email today regarding my situation. This is mainly about my mental health, though there is a hobby silver lining. I have had a bit of a rough time of it lately, and I wanted to get a bit of your input on my mental state and well-being, if possible. Okay? Cool. Starting with the negatives. My situation. I am a young guy, 23, living in the northeast of England with my partner, who I love dearly. Okay, things are going well so far. Things are, as they are for most people in the current climate, difficult. Financial struggles, poor work-life balance... Difficulty finding new people to spend time with. We have been low, though it has been within all this strife that we found our silver lining. We are going to be parents. Oh, mazel tov. Mazel tov. I don't have any wine, but yeah, raise my glass of tea to you, sir. Well done. I was going to be a father. What do you mean, was? Don't, don't, don't make me sad, please. The pregnancy was out of the blue. An accident, and despite how young we are and how difficult our situation is currently, we were over the moon. Scared, but ready for what awaited us in the next nine months. If you need a sip of tea, best take it now before the heavy sets in. Oh no, it's going to happen, isn't it? Mm. At least I've got this massive mug of tea. But we let our hopes get the better of us. I told all of my friends. My partner told her mother. Everybody was so happy for us. Eight weeks in, though, we lost the pregnancy. It was heartbreaking, devastating, but I've struggled to express or truly feel any of it. This is mainly what I wanted your input in. I'm worried about myself. When the nurse sat us down and gave us the news, I didn't cry. I didn't even feel upset. I didn't feel anything and haven't really since. I've always struggled to emote. Not to say I don't feel, but I struggle to express what, what is being internalised. My partner feels emotions with an overwhelming intensity, and because of this the losses hit them pretty hard. Within this, I feel I need to be the rock, the strong one, and I worry I've put myself in this role for so long I can't physically express anymore. My question is this, am I normal? Is it okay to struggle feeling even when faced with situations that should really destroy me? I worry I'm a bit of a freak. I don't want to come off as cold and uncaring as I um, as I really am hurt. I just think I show it differently. Okay. I would want to thank you now for your support you've just given me, though, as stated earlier, there is a silver space marine shaped lining that I'll go into now. A few weeks before this happened, I entered my local games workshop for the first time, and despite all of the horror stories and anxieties that they instill, I have loved every single second of it. The staff have been so incredibly welcoming and have given me so much support in starting my hobby journey. It's thanks to them 
that in this time, I have a place I feel I can go and relax, unwind, and just focus on my mind on my minis. When you talk about the hobby helping stabilise people, I don't think I could overstate how true that is. Just the other day, I completed my first ever mini, Picks Attached. Ooh. Well, we can't do this without any picks, can we? So let's have a little look here. Here we go. Hey, do you know what? For, for a beginner, that ain't bad. That's good. That's really good for a beginner. What a lovely Terminator. Like that guy a lot. He needs some ink. He needs some ink over, over his uh, gold, you know, bronze bits. Just to blend him into the model more. But yeah, looks good. Like it. Excellent stuff. Um, Where was I? Ah, yes. Go back up there, go back up there. Cool. Um, okay. After five hours of painting my local games workshop and the sense of pride that filled me that it filled me with really did help me lift uh, a lot of weight off my shoulders, even if just for a little bit. I want to thank you so much again for reading this and, and my comments that you've made. Uh, I want to apologise for the length and waffling and poor writing. It wasn't poorly written. Don't worry about it, man. Okay. Um, so... Um, no. Thing is, you've answered your own question, in my opinion. In that you said, you know, why am I feeling like this? Well, again, you are literally, mentally, automatically going into being the rock. You, you can't let yourself express those feelings. You can't break down. Now, a lot of people have told me that I'm toxic over the years because I tell men not to emote too much. Um, especially in front of their partner but balls to that dude you're the man of the house right so so you pick your fucking big boy pants up and you be the man you, you tighten your belt you put your stiff upper lip on and you lead the household that's what you're doing okay even if your woman's a strong independent lady who has her own job does her own thing doesn't matter right it, emotionally when you're when you're there you lead the house you're there you're the one in not in charge, but you're the one who she comes to when she needs somebody. It sucks sometimes, yeah. Because sometimes, as, as men, you want to let off some steam too. Mate, that's what your bros are for. And that's what your hobbies are for. People want to change that these days and make it so that you need to talk to your woman about absolutely everything. That's unhealthy. Alright? The amount of times I've seen relationships break apart because the guy does that and the woman loses all fucking respect for him. Don't. I'm not going to say she's going to lose all respect for you straight away, but if you keep going to her with emotional bullshit and going, well, it's just, oh, life's so hard. No, dude, dude, dude. Be more, be stoic, right? Get out there and destroy everything that harms your family. Get out there and absolutely annihilate any threat to them whatsoever. If it's financial, annihilate it. Work harder, you know? If, if there's a bully in school, go in and sort it out with, with the principal or the headmaster, whatever you need to do. You go and make sure you take care of your family. What you are, my friend, is a good man. That's what you are. You're not a psychopath. Your body's, your, your mind is automatically going, this is my woman, her world has broken in half, I need to take care of her. That's what you've done. Straight away, you've, got, you've gone down that, without even needing to, your mind switched and gone, no, no, must put my feelings away and deal with this first. Help, help my woman first. There you go. And you help her. You're leading your household, dude. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to do and what's really, 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 really healthy. That's healthy. A lot of the times in the world now, men are told that their masculine stuff isn't healthy and it's toxic. No, it's not. Because every single time I see it exercised by good men, they make everybody's lives around them more positive. Especially if it's their wife or girlfriend that's around them. You, I'm telling you now, you are, you've never been more attractive to your girl than right now. Than when, when you're being, you've got your own feelings, and you've told me that you're dealing with them. Do you know how you're dealing with them, dude? You started Warhammer. You did exactly the right thing. You channeled your pain and your anguish into creating something cool. Because that's why men are amazing. That's what we do. What we don't do is sit there wallowing and crying. That's not a bad thing to do if you're a woman. That's, that's what happens. I, we, we've, we've all dated enough of them to know that's what they do. 
they, they sit in them for a while. In fact, it's very healthy what they do. They sit in it for a while, they cry, they get it out of their system, and they work it out that way. They're very loudly, most of them, very loudly. Men are, by and large, don't do that, and it's not healthy for us to do that. What it's healthy for us to do is be stoic, look after our families, and then channel our pain and our anguish into doing something positive. Whether it's the hobby, whether it's fixing your car, whether it's building something, whether it's writing a song or writing a book, or, or we channel it somehow into something else. That's what we do as men. You've literally got the answers all there, dude, and you're doing it all correctly. You're amazing, man. Well, well done. You did it straight away. You literally went, no, take care of my woman. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be her rock. I'm going to take care of her. This is the woman I love, and, and, and we have just had a boatload of misery be heaped on us. I'm going to take care of her first. And then you stagger away, you know, barely holding it together. You go into King's Workshop and go, can I have the Leviathan box set, please? And they go, yeah, there you go. And you are thank you. Oh, and you start painting. Right? You did exactly the right thing already. You don't need my advice. You did exactly the right thing. All right? If you don't feel anything ever, well, I've known guys that are like that, right? It doesn't mean you're psycho. It doesn't mean you're weird. I've known guys that are like that who aren't very emotional. It just is what it is. I don't think that's you, though, because you've even told me that you're feeling this way. Do you know what I mean? You just didn't at the time around her, and that's completely healthy. Completely healthy. Your protection instinct kicked in, and you, and you did some man shit, dude. You did some man shit. What you're telling me here is people around you have told you that being stoic and being manly is somehow toxic it's not it's not right what you did was completely healthy it helped your woman out and you're helping yourself through the hobby good lad excellent excellent stuff all right cool moving on if you like what i do by the way please subscribe to the channel that'd be awesome you know you can really 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 help me out if you can do that go and hit that subscribe button it would be awesome for me um, help the channel grow and all that we're trying to get towards 20,000 subscribers we've just hit 15,000 a few weeks ago so if we can continue pushing that would be amazing so if you are new around here hit the subscribe button and if you think my videos will do the job for somebody else maybe mentally or whatever then please send my stuff over there maybe they'll, they'll subscribe you never know also if you're going to buy any models head on over to Composite Games they do a hell of a job for the channel man they do an amazing amazing job lovely lovely people over there and uh, yeah they really do do a lot for me so if you could go and help them out that by by getting any models that you are going to get towards the christmas period maybe give them some love just saying use the promo code northern exile down below to get yourself five percent off your order there at checkout whatever you need dnd 40k warhammer Sig age of sigmar whatever you need they've got it head on over there have some fun cool right next uh, dave says Hi there, Intermittent Lurker here, and I enjoy listening to your videos whilst painting. Okay, man, no worries. This is my first time ever telling a story of my own, and it, and it involves a campaign I ran about a year ago using a system that maybe 0.01% of your audience would ever have heard of, but was mechanically, basically, just path, Pathfinder. Okay. I actually like Pathfinder. It's not, not, a, not a bad thing. You know, quite like Pathfinder. And a player who just couldn't figure out the genre they were playing in. Apologies in advance for the length of the story and the fact that it won't be as dramatic as other stories of this size. Okay. Way to, like, shit on your own story from above, by the way. I often think, like, somebody's, like, painting their models and they hear their own story even if their name's been changed and they just like mess up the model like oh my god yeah, no. hopefully it hasn't happened to you for backstory i tend to run a lot of experimental games among my friends group a lot of my campaigns are super unique and are often the first attempt by any of us at the sort at the sort of game that we're playing for example among our group i was the first to run an open world survival game a combat based dungeon crawler etc I tried to run, a, to run an XCOM style game once, where players were managing an, an overarching war campaign to, li to liberate a city, going on a secret mission in the city each session. Most of my campaigns fizzled out though, 
which I can live with. You win some, you lose some. But I'm always trying to innovate and run things that nobody in this group has ever seen before. This particular campaign involved me and one other player, who we'll call Bumblebee, because they were a Transformers fan and real name redacted, naturally. Bumblebee's player was male, but their character was female, so I might accidentally switch back and forth between, between he and she pronouns to describe them. Sorry in advance for the lack of proofreading. Anyways, the idea behind this campaign was, as always, very weird. I had my player wake up on a boat with a gunshot wound. No knowledge of themselves, their history, what led them there, or even a character sheet. If you're thinking, this sounds like the born identity, you'd be right. My screenwriting professor once said that bad writers steal, and good writers steal from everything. The campaign was meant to be a spy thriller, where the player would slowly have their own sheet delivered to them piece by piece, with every skill check they made, as they attempt to uncover who they are, what happened to them, and what nefarious scheme they're entangled in. In hindsight, I probably should have given more mechanical info to my player, or just given them their sheet off the bat, but I was hoping that making the game so mysterious that it was mysterious even on a meta level would be spicy and entertaining. Okay, no, I see what you're doing there. That, that sounds like a good idea. Okay, in any case, Bumblebee's character wakes up on the boat, discovers they're injured, and that they have a little piece of paper directing them to a bank on a nearby island. They then meet the sailors on the boat and make fast friends with them, perhaps too fast. Pretty quickly, they begin using the, the sailors to essentially just brute force, revealing their stat line. I tell this sailor, to, uh, I, I quote, I tell this sailor to ask me a complicated maths question, and I'll use intelligence roll to, to solve it. This was part of why I say I should have given them the sheet, because instead of the mystery enticing them, they just decided to speed run filling out their sheet. If this were on the only problem, I could live with it, but of course, it wasn't. Yeah, I think what you've done here, dude, you, you've... I, I've got a friend of mine who, who, who designs video games, right? He's a, he's a video game developer. And he's worked for Obsidian in the past. He got into touch with me. Well, I think he still works there. Anyway, he got in touch with me like a few... Must have been about a year ago now. Because he liked the channel, liked what I was doing, and, and we had a little conversation. And the thing that he said about Fallout New Vegas when they were making that game was that they had to decide how much to trust the player not to be a dick. Now, I don't mean, you know, not playing an evil character. That's fine. I mean, not being a dick as, you know, not gaming the system to, to try and get, you know, points and things. How, mu how much do you trust a player not to be an asshole? Not to, like, try and break it just for, just for breaking its sake. And they felt that they hit, like, a, a nice middle ground there. Of the game being, being, you know, difficult, but you can overcome it by role-playing much easier than you can actually trying to break the game. Essentially, what he said was, never, ever, ever trust your players not to be assholes with the rule set that you've given them. There will always be one, at least one, in a group of three who will try to metagame and basically break your rules apart to make the most overpowered, insane, ridiculous thing ever. Yeah? Those people can be very, very, very uh, useful for testing out your game system. I've got a guy called David who does that, right? He, he's, he's from the States. He was in uh, Black Coats, if you ever saw that. He does that with game systems. He breaks them apart and creates things that are really, really, really powerful, you know, and, and goes at it from there. And it's really helpful to have him around to try and see where the weak points in my rules are. Um, so what you've done here is you've trusted your player to not be a dick. And they've taken that trust and thrown it right back in your face because you shouldn't hand them the keys. You shouldn't trust them to not be dicks, right? Anyway. So, with them becoming so chummy with these throwaway NPCs, I decide to throw a curveball by making one NPC a belligerent and grumpy old man who was categorically uninterested in making friends. Well, you could have done that with everybody, dude. It would have saved you a lot of time. They approach him, buried in the engine room, working on the boat and try to strike up a conversation he naturally tells them to go away and that he's busy what follows is word for word their response uh, they're there she chuckled 
head patting the angry engineer. This was all online, and I've got the game archived, so I can pull exact quotes from it. For some completely inexplicable reason, Bumblebee found himself playing an amnesiac with a gunshot wound, an info pointing towards a bank account, and decided to portray the character as some sort of oo small bean. I was, I was a bit floored by this anime character, and asked if they were sure about that, and they were. So naturally, the engineer took a swing at them to get them to stop. Because personal space and all that, yeah. This resulted in a, in a small fight that ended up breaking the engine of the ship. Now, the engine breaking was very lucky for me because it was a response to another a fit critical problem. Upon finding the secret note with the bank account listed, the first thing Bumblebee did was go straight to the captain and say, we need to steer clear of that island. The only lead they had so far was pointing them directly to the island, and they were intent on doing everything in their power to avoid it. Again, you've trusted your player not to be an arsehole. You know? Um, the, the true skill of a DM, for me, is railroading your, your players without them realising they've been railroaded. Never, ever, ever, ever do a truly sandbox game. They, they nearly never work. And they only ever work if you're a DM of the absolute highest skill. If you're not that, right? And no, Matt Mercer is not one of those people, right? If you're not that, then don't do it. The true skill of a DM is railroading your, your, your players completely without them realising they've been railroaded. Without them even realising it. That's the true skill of a DM. That they think they've done everything, when in reality, you've steered them towards where you want them to go. You know, the, the, the veil behind the game is never revealed. You know, you're, they're, always, they're always going in the direction you want them to go in. Anyway, luckily, the engine being damaged resulted in the boat having to stop off at that island for repairs. Forced into actually following their only narrative lead, Bumblebee departed in search of the bank. Dude, this story, I'm, I'm, I don't know why, but I'm gripped. <laughs> I don't want it to end. On their way there, they met a pickpocket on the subway and get into a fight with them. It was, meant to, to, uh, it was meant as a throwaway fight to get them accustomed to combat since it was their first time playing the system and I had homebrewed some extra rules to make combat even more dangerous. Right? It sounds like they're in New York, by the way. It sounds like you were in the Hudson River and now you're in New York. Just, you know, off the top of my head. Maybe Chicago or something, I don't know. After beating them and retrieving their stolen money, they decide to turn the pickpocket into some sort of slave lackey and have the pickpocket follow them around to carry all of their stuff. This struck me as odd, but it wouldn't be the first time a tabletop RPG player acquired an unwilling volunteer follower. Yeah, you guys are all degenerates, that's why. What is weird, however, was that they got to the bank and told their unwilling accomplice to go in alone to investigate the security systems. Again, I asked, are you sure you want to send your hostage off into an area patrolled by law enforcement by himself? And they were stalwart about it. So naturally, the pickpocket ratted them out to the police the second they were able to. <laughs> Realising they had made a mistake, we walked things back, and they manipulated the police into arresting him without letting him expose Bumblebee's crimes, but not before head-patting him. Standard remorseless psycho player behaviour. Dude, again, you're your own worst enemy. Let the peop let your player fail. Let your player fail and face the consequences. She should be in jail. Right? And then, what I would do here... I would throw this girl in jail, right? And then have some mysterious benefactor bail her out. And the mysterious benefactor is tied to the overall plot. And basically says, follow me. And he, and he takes her to the, uh, the, the the box that you needed to get to, to open. The safety deposit box. And then he disappears, right? And that guy can be a recurring character throughout if you want to. That's what you do. You let them face the consequences of their own actions, right? And they lose points for being in jail for a while, like stat points. That's a, that's a real lesson. Don't don't mess around, right? And then they get put back on the 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 road the road track 
the railroad without realizing it. Okay? That's what you do. Anyway. I would judge, but at my first ever time in the system, I, as a cop, chopped the arms off of a corpse and, and installed them into a cyborg to assist me. Players sometimes forget the NPCs are supposed to be real people too. Fast forwarding a bit, they retrieve a dead drop from the bank and go to a designated meetup point in a hotel which turns out to be an ambush. They're attacked by a much bigger and scarier being, a four-armed regenerative am amphibious tank, armed with a minigun. He's a bit of a Tarasque, picture Adam Smasher from Cyberpunk, insanely dangerous, and his only weakness is that he's slower than Bumblebee, which they realise pretty instantly. Despite knowing this, they insist on trying to fight him. It goes very poorly, and they're knocked down from around 90 HP to 6. At this time, corrupt cops swarm the building, and I throw them a bone by having the cops get distracted by fighting the big guy, and placing the fire escape right behind Bumblebee. I'm praying with all my might that they just take the hint and get the fuck out of there. They continue trying to fight him. Again, you're relying on your player not being an asshole, And they're letting you down. At this point, I'm over it. And have the assassin pick her up and throw her out the, uh, throw her out the window. Where she's spared by a convenient uh, eight awning that leaves her at 1 HP. She stumbles away, finally getting the message. Once again, fast forwarding. Bumblebee's character is framed for the incident at the hotel and becomes a wanted fugitive. Visits an underground doctor, gets patched up, gives the doctor some, some uh, head pats, and, and, follow, and follows a lead involving a newspaper syndicate who interviewed a guy who was the target of an assassination, and so on and so forth. Complex, intrigue stuff. Arriving at the home office of the newspaper, they find it surrounded by cops, having recently been attacked by the minigun-wielding assassin. Sneaking around the side, they see a back door in an alleyway, flanked by two cops who aren't paying close attention. I figure it's a perfect situation for some sneaking. They can throw a coin, the guards come to investigate, they sneak past, and the guards say, huh, must have been the wind. Something like that. What really happened was, she attempts to throw a knife at the closer one whilst remaining around the corner. Yep, she attacks the cops who have walkie-talkies and have been standing around the corner from her and a full-scale police barricade. Luckily, using some magic and an inordinate amount of violence, she dispatches the cops, then decides to climb the wall of the building to sneak in through the roof anyways, making the murders unnecessary and putting the rest of the cops on high alert. Fucking sigh. They sneak into the building and find an editor, hoping to get some answers from him. On doing so, they tell the editor they're just a regular civilian who walked in hoping to ask some questions. The editor is, naturally, quite confused. Uh, you're the... Uh, but how did you get in? This is a crime scene, he asks. I just did, she says. The cops just let you in? I mean, now isn't a really good time for visitors. Realising their story didn't make any sense, they immediately fold and just start telling this random employee that they have no cause to trust anything or anything about themselves. The editor is, at this point, very confused, and just wants her to leave before the cops find the two talking, but Bumblebee manages a very good persuasion role to convince them not to tell everything they've just heard to the cops, which was lucky, because if they had failed, they would have just sp spilled everything to the cops. This is now the second time Bumblebee trusted an NPC with critical information about her, their illegal activities, then just assumed the NPC wouldn't tell the cops about it. Leaving, she escapes onto the rooftop, since the building is being searched by the cops, since they found two dead cops outside, go figure. There, she sees a police helicopter searching for her, though it hasn't spotted her yet. Their response, and this is the last message they sent, before the campaign fizzled out, was to pull out their pistol and take aim at the helicopter. The campaign ended unceremoniously when they got offended at me making a joke about the French and cut ties with me and the rest of the community entirely after that. I made a handful of mistakes throughout the, throughout the game and outside of it 
I will definitely admit, but I've never met a player who had less of a clue what game they were playing in. From the moment they set foot on the island, they were in a cyberpunk version of The Fugitive combined with Jason Bourne, with their character being a master of disguise and infiltration uh, who couldn't trust anyone, yet they insisted on playing their character as some sort of friendly, head-patting fuzzy wuzzy who, uh, whose, own, whose only solution to any obstacle was physical violence and overwhelming misplaced trust. Overall, I just don't know what I could have done to salvage the game, outside of maybe having a different player. It was very bizarre though. I will say it is the most awful RPG horror story I can tell that it is about a player who didn't know what genre they were in and made dumb decisions. I've made out pretty lucky compared to some of the other stories that I've heard anyway. Anyways, thanks for taking the time to read and God bless. Cheers, man. Um, well, I've already covered the mistakes that you made. You know, you trusted her not to be a dickhead and they were. So there you go. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with stopping your campaign, stopping your game, taking your player aside, or taking your all of your players aside, and saying, look, look, this isn't the game we're playing, all right? The game we're playing is this, and, and you very clearly lay out what the game is, okay? You trusted your player not to be a dick. You said, you said nothing about what kind of game they were playing. They had no clue what they were getting into. They only knew the starting premise. And so, onto a blank canvas, they started to paint the world that they wanted. Rather than the one that was actually there. Do you know what I mean? Every player, even somebody coming into it cold, like you were doing there, needs a standard template to go off of what kind of a world you're playing in. That's not giving any sort of spoilers, right? You say, yeah, what kind of a world are you going to be playing in? What kind of characters are going to be in, are going to be inhabiting the world? What kind of a character would be sensible to play as in the world? And then from there on, go. You can still do all of the intrigue stuff. You can still do all of the masking your your past, masking your 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 capabilities stuff. You can still do all that, you know. But you've set the standard and you've set the expectations already, ready to go. You know, if you don't do that, you get stories like what you've just written there. Alrighty. Uh, Zach says, Hello Northern. You can call me Zach. I have done. I have been listening to your channel for about six months now after being turned on to it by Yancey, my friend who's had a few stories read out by you. I remember the name, yes. Before going any further, I wanted to say I appreciate your channel, especially some of the advice you've been able to give to some of your, uh, to some of your followers. It is sad how many people are in bad places, but a lifeline of any kind can really help. Cheers, man. I am a big history buff myself, and throughout my life have often lived by the idea that we can learn much about uh, how to live and act today by studying the past. I got into history in the second grade when I came across a series of books in our school library that were essentially just compilations of photos from World War II. Thinking back on it, some of those images would probably be considered a bit extreme for someone that young, but it still got me interested in history. Right now, I am mostly interested in reading about the conflict between Europe and the Ottoman Empire, and I found some great books on the subject if you are interested. Yeah, sure, send them to me. Send them to me. You often mention, mention Emperor Marcus Aurelius's meditations as a good reference for, li for living a good life. While I haven't finished my copy of this work yet, I can say that an... an Enchiridion by Epictetus really helped me through a hard time in my life, where the woman, who would eventually become my wife, was really unfairly being attacked by my family, and the pressure, trying to please both sides, was putting, was putting me in a bad place mentally. That's a whole other nightmare, but doesn't really have anything to do with the hobby. So, continuing on. I would recommend Enchirid Enchiridion to anybody who feels that they are struggling to control their lives. It gives me, it gave me a good way to centre myself and focus on what I could control and let go of at least not worry about things that I couldn't. Anyways, a little about myself. I have been into the Warhammer hobby since 3rd edition 40k and 6th edition Warhammer Fantasy. Okay. The wonderful 3rd edition Warhammer 40k starter set uh, box by John Blanche with the Black Templars is still something that is peak 40k to me. Me too, man. Me too. Me too. 
I have played Blood Angels and Vestroians for most of my 40k career before turning to Iron Warriors when 30k dropped in 7th. Since then, I haven't looked back at 40k and from what my buddies say, it's become kind of a mess. About halfway through the first edition of 30k Forge World uh, dropped rules for Imperialist Militia. Essentially, the old Imperial Army, and I was hooked. I had always been more of a fan of the average grunts in 40k, the poor, norm, mo, no, uh, sorry, the poor mortal humans who have to fight superhuman warriors and alien horrors, and the militia were a touchstone for that, and they have been in my, my main army ever since. I have included a, a few images of them, as well as an Iron Warrior Siegebreaker, if you want to check them out. Ooh, okay. Uh, did we save them? That's the point. Did we save them before we record? If we didn't, I can't show them. It'd take me too long to do that. Um, da -de -da. Um, I don't think we did. So, I won't be able to show them, but I will have a look at them on my own time. On with the story. Um... I really like the old lore of the Warhammer 40k universe, especially the work of Dan Abnett, like Gaunt's Ghosts and his Inquisition series where characters died, and often the stories were less about stomping the latest Saturday morning cartoon villain, and more about trying to win one more second of existence from the universe and its terrors. The Inquisition series in particular, where the hero keeps fighting until they have really become something that they would have seen as the enemy at the start of the series, really st uh, stuck with me as good reading, and I would recommend them to anybody as a good sci-fi books in general. Yeah, he's talking about the Eisenhorn series. The Eisenhorn series are very, very, very good. Ravenor 2, to a lesser extent. Anyway, on to the reason I'm sending you this email. I have a hobby nightmare that my aforementioned friend Yancey encouraged me to send to you. If you like it, fortunately or unfortunately, I have a few more I can send your way. Yeah, do so, do so. So this story takes place around the third edition of 40k. I was playing my Blood Angels with that with that uh, with that thing. Sorry, I don't know what that means. I was playing Blood Angels with that thing, little folio of a codex. If you remember it, my army wasn't the most amazing, but I learned, uh, but I leaned into the jump pack theme with lots of deep striking assault marines led by Dante and sometimes Mephisto who would tag along as well. My opponent on the night in question was the resident Grey Knights player, back when their codex was called Codex Demon Hunters. Yeah, so back then, for those of you who don't know, Grey Knights were the most broken army in 40k history at that point. And most of the people who played them back then were either, you know, people who were well-meaning and just liked Grey Knights, or meta-chasing douchebags who threw their, threw their dummy out the pram any single time something went, went against them in a game, right? And as such, the reputation of Grey Knights was, besmir was besmirched, and they've never recovered. Unlike Ultramarines, who have recovered in time, because a lot because Games Workshop pushed them as the center, center piece of every single edition that they do, right? Well, unfortunately, Grey Knights aren't. We're, we're off to the side. And so people tend to still think that were one of these super powerful, overpowered factions when that happened like, like 17, 18 years ago, dude. We're, we're now one of the one of the worst, and we've been one of the worst for the past five or six fucking editions of the game. We've been one of the worst. So yeah. <sighs> anyway, North, I know what you're probably saying. A man of culture, right, right about now. No, no, I'm not. Because if you collected the Codex Demon Hunters, no, you you were following the meta. You weren't a man of culture. Sorry, you know you you, you weren't following what you you think is cool. Most of you, if you collected that Codex, were following the meta and that you wanted to win games. That's not a man of culture. All right, there's a difference. Um, so I'm sorry to inform you that the Grey Knight player is in fact the Nightmare player. Cue horror music in the background, right? Nope. 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 Probably a good time for a sip of tea, because here comes the cringe. Ooh, I like it when you tell me to sip tea. Okay, good. <clears throat> so. 
I was working and taking college classes at the time, so usually my gaming happened in the evening hours. I remember that it was dark out and it always seemed that our local games workshop, the chill people and the weirdos, tended to file in around this time. I used to live in California before moving to Texas, so my, my bar for what is odd behaviour is sadly a bit high, but I can tell you my opponent that night exceeded it. This young man, who out of respect to a previous submitter, we will call Steve. Oh, look at your luck, Dave. Look, Dave, you're starting to infect other people. Well, well, you know, be the change you want in the world, I suppose, right? We're now moving on to Steve's instead of Dave's. Okay, fine. This young man, who out of respect to a previous submitter, we will call Steve, was around my height, a bit on the larger side with a mess of blonde hair. He always came in wearing a sort of army jacket on and was usually quite loud. I hadn't had a chance to play him before but I would always know if he was in the store playing a game because his shouting could have woken Gilliman from a stasis pod a whole five editions sooner. Often this behaviour would be the result of poor dice rolling on his part, often bemoaning the bad luck he had suffered. Unfortunately for me, what I, when I arrived that fateful night, Eager to forget about work and school, Steve was the only player available. In my mind, I was only thinking, what's the worst that could happen? And I offered the man a game, which he accepted. Now, correct me if I am wrong, but I believe that 3rd edition was one of those editions where Armour 14 was very hard to kill. Yes, it was. Um, when the uh, Land Raider dropped and had 14 all around, mostly. Or oh, did it have 13, 12 at the back? Can't remember. Um, but it had 14 around most of its armor. And so it's basically unkillable. You know, it, you had to hit it with some serious firepower to kill it, essentially. I have memories of fighting Necrons on their not invincible monoliths. Anyway, suffice to say that as Steve's army was placed on the table, my heart sank a bit. His force was mostly Terminators and Land Raiders. Grey Knight Terminators at that, and my mostly jump back infantry army was ill equipped to handle something like that in the days before melter pistols or assaulting them from, from deep or assaulting sorry from deep strike. Still, I have simply enjoyed gaming over winning, so I rolled with it. Yeah, that sucked back in third edition, man. You deep strike in and you can't move. That sucked so much. Ugh. The first red flag emerged. In the roll to see who went first. I won the roll off, and almost immediately, Steve started yelling. The strange thing was, he didn't yell at me or at the dice gods above, or the demons in hell, or just the uncaring cosmos. No. North, this adult, about age 20 at the time, leaned over the table and started screaming at the dice that had just had the temerity to roll a three against my dice's four. This man berated the, that, that poor cube for about three minutes, like it was a dog that had just killed a prized chicken. All the while, I was awkwardly standing across the table, and not really knowing what else to do, I began moving my tactical squads around so the heavy weapon marines had the best angle on his tanks, trying to let him know what I was doing in the brief pauses as he took a big swig of air to continue his tirade. <laughs> Oh my god. At the end at the end of it he put the dice in the far corner of the table. He said he was starting his pile of dice uh, that he that he planned to melt in a fire when he got home. Okay. Need another sip of tea? No, I'm good for now. No, actually no, yeah, I will take a sip of tea. You, you can't say that without me taking one. By the time I finished moving my few models on the table, most of my army was in reserve, ready to deep strike. He had calmed down, so I was able to inform him that my squads were going to shoot. He asked me what I could shoot at, as all of his infantry were safe inside of his land raiders, and my tacticals mostly had bolters. I pointed out to him that in each of the two ten-man squads, I had a last cannon marine. And I saw a look cross his face, something between Murray and anger. I think he had been so distracted by his dice that he hadn't really paid attention to what I was doing, 
And now I had two t two las cannons lined up on his death death squad death star squad, sorry, inside of his land raider. Well, I get a cover save, he exclaimed loudly, without even looking at the line of sight or anything. I corrected him that yes, he had a cover save for one of the last cannons, but not the other, which he begrudgingly accepted. I rolled the first hit with the last cannons with a clear line of fire, but missed. I could see the look of glee on Steve's face. The second shot hit, however, with a new choice of with a few choice words coming out of my opponent directed at his tank and the ruins that was opposed to block the shot. With a sense of dread, I watched as he picked up the dice, ready to make the cover save and let it roll. Of course it failed, rolling a two when he needed a four. North, take a sip of tea. Okay, cool. I swear to God, if you all ganged up and you know did hobby nightmares that told me to, to drink tea halfway through, you might be able to make me go to the toilet in between recording, which would be quite funny. Um, like a social experiment with North, I don't know. Ready? Okay. Steve took the offending cover dice and slammed it into the tabletop surface closest to him. Then he took every last one of his dice and arranged them in a circle around the detainee so they could all witness the punishment he had in store. This man then proceeded to sternly rebuke the unresponsive dice. His voice got so loud that everybody in the store was beginning to throw amazed looks in our direction. Naturally, the dice didn't seem to understand the offence it had caused, and so was duly sent clattering into the melt pile. A bit relieved that that was over, I rolled for damage. And lo and behold, I blew the tank up. Yeah, you could do that in third. Yeah. Rock penetra penetrating strike. I had a friend, though, back in the day. At university, he knows who he is, right? And he would always make me giggle because he—I don't know whether he's autistic or whatever—but like he, I, I, he knows who he is. It's, he is really funny. Uh, he's like the kind of guy who's hilarious without realizing he's hilarious, you know. Anyway, he'd roll—he'd roll like to hit, and he'd roll like to damage, and he goes, "Okay," and, and then he'd roll another dice, and then uh, he'd roll a dice when when uh, shooting at a tank and go penetration really loud, and I just—it just really. I just, every single time I'd giggle, and I'd, and everyone would look over like, at this guy, penetration, and I, he didn't get why it was funny, and that just made it funnier, I just, that's just, that's just, no, it just makes me giggle, I really wish they'd bring back, you know, glancing hits and penetrating hits back, just so I can hear him do that again, it's really, really funny, um, you know, hit, penetration, <laughs> just every time, brilliant, anyway, uh, a bit relieved that that was over, I rolled for damage. And lo and behold, I blew the tank up. Yeah, penetrating hit and, you know, rolling high on the damage table. Six. I think it's like, if you get penetrating hit and roll a six, bang, it just explodes. Now, vehicle explosion damage was quite strong back then, I think. But even if it wasn't, his poor damaged dice weren't up for the task. North, never have I prayed so fervently that my opponent's dice be hot and rolling well. I remember he failed nearly every save for his prized Terminator squad. In my mind, their death still invoke a sense of dread. Steve grabbed the, grabbed the dice he used to make the saves in one hand and pointed to the melt pile with the other. I distinctly remember he yelled something along the lines of, didn't I make an example out of them? Before chucking the handful of dice across the store Hitting a few patrons and their models. Wow. Wow. At that, the store manager finally got up from behind his till and asked Steve to keep it down. The rest of the game was thankfully short-lived, and Steve was silent throughout the rest of the of it, openly, openly, uh, only piping up to declare what he was doing. I don't remember if I even won or lost that game. We still shook hands at the end, but that still remains one of the most awkward and confusing games of Warhammer I've ever had in my life. I learned that day a game is only as enjoyable as you or your opponent make it. So what do you think, North? Ever encountered somebody who punished his dice before? Let me know if you want to hear more stories. I have quite a few of my time in the hobby. Cheers and thanks for all you do, Zach. Yes, please send me some more. That was really well written and really fun. Um, no, I have never really come across somebody... I've come across people hurling one dice across the room like I've done that before when I've been like fucking 
and there's but it's always been in jest it's never been in you know like oh uh, it's always been like fucking dice and because everyone's already laughing and i chuck it at the ceiling or something you know behind me or whatever and it's, it's, it just generates so much more like people start laughing and if you just lose it and you get your i once hid in a closet so um yeah i was playing in 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 uh in a uni in my dorm room so i was playing 40k with a friend of mine and all i needed to do to like i essentially have caldor drago win the game for me was not roll a, a one to charge you know because like three inches away uh four inches away whatever i rolled a double one and i literally stood up looked at my opponent who was starting to giggle and i, I had a straight face i was gutted i walked i got into his closet and refused to come out and it was just like I just, it, it, just hearing it, he literally lost his shit. He li he didn't stop laughing for about an, like an, a good hour. We went down to the bar later in the in the college, and he still was was just this, you know, muttly sniggering to himself. He was just absolutely, you know, absolutely uh, corpsing. But the things you do to like make light of the game, I wasn't being serious there. You know, I was I was taking the piss. But like it was a slapstick, and, you, and sometimes you do that with dice. It's fine. You, know, you just, you, you know, I've seen guys just go ugh and like chuck them, chuck the dice behind him, like really, like you know, nonchalantly. That's funny as well. Like it happens all the time. But to pick up like a load of them and hurl them across the room, no, dude, that that don't be a dick, you know. Anyway, love your long time. I will speak to you tomorrow for another uh, 40k rant. Should be an interesting one. I may have a bit of a surprise for you because I think. I think me and Outer Circle are going to get together again and have a nice conversation tomorrow about certain things going wrong in the hobby going forward. So we'll see about that. I love you a long time. I'll speak to you then. Have a good one. Bye now.